Thank you very much, Sean. So my name is Ashkan, and I'm working for Austell. And I'm going to talk about some of our uh, recent work that we try to use AI and ML, uh, how we're using it in Austell, with a specific focus to our, uh, if we can actually use it for predictive motion control for high-speed crafts. So I'm going tonight, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, uh, introduction to how fantastic Austell it is. <laughs> and uh, then I will basically uh, uh, tell you a little bit of our uh, projects that we do at Austell, which is related to AI. And, uh, and then I will go basically to our, the main uh, focus of the night, which is on motion control and predictive motion control. So in general about Austell, we basically, we are shipbuilders. We build uh, ships, we're building really cool ships. We have uh, several shipyards across the world. We have shipyards in the US which is essentially building mainly for U.S. Navy. Uh, we have LCS class, EPF class, uh, and they've been, several of them have been delivered and also under construction. Uh, the, our headquarters mainly here is actually here in Perth, in Henderson, uh, which, we will build, uh, which we are building Navy and commercial vessels. We have, had, uh, we have uh, shipyards in uh, uh, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, and also a joint venture in uh, China, which are being mainly focused on building commercial vessels. And you can see that we build ships from different sizes, from 42 meters to 117 meters uh, vessels, from different types of the vessels, monohulls, catamarans, trimarans. So very, very different types of vessels. And the, the, one of the things that we really like about Austell is that it's not just a shipbuilding company, but we're also doing, focusing a lot on uh, technology development and R&D. And we do, we have some really cool uh, R&D projects at Austell. Uh, to give you an example, some of the examples here, for example, the Lucy project, which is mainly driven, data-driven uh, maintenance uh, system, which is now uh, built and uh, on running on uh, basically uh, the Navy vessels. Uh, we have Marinlink Smart, which we talked about it, uh, I think about two years ago, and we talked about it a bit more tonight. And it's essentially, data-driven machine learning uh, improvement of operations of these vessels. We have a very really interesting project we recently did on electric vessels and, of course, autonomous vessels. And this is mainly uh, being uh, running at the uh, U.S., uh, but we're also doing, uh, looking into it at Australia as well. So uh, going a bit into more uh, projects that uh, we are doing in the data analytics group at uh, Austell, uh, I want to, tonight, I want to talk about a little bit first about how we use AI and machine learning across both design and operations of the vessels. So we have several projects as an example that I will talk about here. That, for example, uh, how we optimize our design uh, process using these uh, tools and then how we actually use these tools to help operators run their vessels better. Uh, so essentially, when a, a classic way of designing things uh, in engineering is that there's a design engineer with a bit of knowledge, uh, and that, that design engineering essentially will be tasked to design a specific thing. And the way that it does it then, it has some understanding of the constraints and it has some basically limited time that it actually explores a solution area to find the, the best solution that he can. So of course, this doesn't allow the, the design engineer to actually explore the full potential of the, the, the space and finding the best solution possible, uh, because that, uh, that would take a lot of time and would be very costly. So here we thought that, okay, we can actually use AI and particularly evolutionary uh, strategies to do the optimizations. So the way that we do it is that uh, the designer, uh, the design engineer job is to define the constraints and the cost functions and then we allow the, uh, uh, the AI approach to actually take over and run the simulations and find the, uh, and uh, evolve these geometries to actually find the optimum solutions. We tested that on two examples. For example, designing a bulb spout for a ship, and uh, uh, it should be sure that with AI, for the particular speed that it was uh, focused on, it could really outperform the best design that our engineer could actually do and, uh, uh, and reduce the resistance of the vessel. And then also we, we use it for an uh, FEA, which is a structure analysis. And we again show that we could actually reduce the weight if we optimize how this is stiffened or uh, stiffened plate are actually distributed across uh, the surface. And this is an example that was very hard, for example, for a single person to actually to be able to do it. But through that, we realized that one of still the bottlenecks was that doing these simulations and relying on the engineering packages to do the simulations is really time consuming. So we said that, okay, can we use 
ML here to actually predict what would be the outcome of these engineering simulations. And an example that I'm showing here, and I hope that we talk about that in a specific uh, dedicated session to it uh, here in the near future, is that we basically says that if we, because we're doing a lot of simulations, and if, if can we build an ML model, uh, which basically as an input to it will be the 3D surface geometry of the, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, for example, vessel here, and the output would be, the, for example, the pressure distributions, uh, here as an example for the wind drag, and predict exactly what would the uh, engineering simulation would, uh, would result in it across that, uh, the whole 3D surface, uh, the mesh of it, and also what would be the scalar coefficients. And you can see here the initial models that we built using the graph convolution neural networks. Essentially, we could actually have a very good agreement between our predictions and what an engineering simulation could actually done. And then we, on top of this, we're actually building shape optimizations. Which again, we try to use a neural network, and particularly DeepSCF, which basically to try to actually learn the representations of the geometry uh, through that, and then uh, combine that with uh, the, this model to actually do the optimizations. So essentially running the optimizations and uh, uh, bas uh, basically the predictions and the simulation, everything through uh, uh, ML uh, and then in a much, much shorter time. The other, uh, the other product that we actually want to talk about is MarineLink Smart, which is this, this is, uh, again, as I mentioned, we talked about this about two years ago here. But this is essentially, we, we have all these ships. We, have, we put a lot of sensor on these ships. We gather this data. And from this data, then we build uh, uh, machine learning models that predict different criteria. Uh, for example, uh, predict the fuel consumptions of the vessel under different conditions. And then we use those models to on, on, on basically on board of the vessel to do the optimizations and then provide advice to crew how do they have to uh, set the vessel to minimize particular uh, uh, objective, for example, minimize the, uh, the fuel consumption or arrive into their destination exactly on time. And all of these things done through basically gathering data on the ship, building models, uh, predictive models, and then uh, running uh, uh, those predictive models and optimization on board of the vessels. I will talk about it because we use this, for example, for the motion uh, uh, optimizations. Now, going to the main point, point of the talk tonight, which is motion control. So essentially, to give you a bit of uh, introduction, what happens here is that the vessels are uh, equipped with the, these are high speed vessels. They are equipped with different types of what we call them control surfaces. So these control surfaces, for example, uh, here you can see combinations of the build skills, roll fins, you can see T foils, you can see the, uh, trim tabs, interceptors. So what, what happens here is that when the vessel is actually moving in the water, there's a pressure change, the pressure distributions around these, uh, around these surfaces. And by changing the angle of the flow, attack of the flow to these surfaces, we can create change the amount of the lift force that these surfaces actually generate. Changing that lift force, the lift force, essentially what happens is that that changes the force or the moment that these uh, uh, surfaces exert on the ship. If you look at it, a, a classical control diagram of it, so the ship is basically subjected to the environmental forces, which mainly we're talking about the wave forces here. We do the measurements of the motions of the vessel. We pass that to the controller. The controller has to actually adjust the angle of the attack or the angle of these foils such that then uh, such that to opt to, to basically contract this uh, excitation force that uh, comes from the waves and that will pass to an actuator which actuator then moves the surface and that, that results in the total force that acting on the ship. So there is, in fact, there is another controller actually sitting here as well which we are not talking about it. Our main focus is actually talking about the controller actually sitting here. And this is because mainly this controller that sits here is actually a much simpler controller. So in, in a classic, how it's, how it's been done in a classical way, it's been done through, for example, a PID controller, which you can see it in a, in a basically lot of space that is written here. And in, in OSCIL, we have our own nonlinear uh, control function, which the input to this control function, again, as I mentioned, are the measurements that comes from the vessel. And the output is essentially this command or the angle of these foils. But just a simple looking at this and intuitively thinking is that these coefficients or the behavior of this controller should really depend on the environmental condition. So how fast you want to or how much you want to actually, be, for example, you can see here we have the influence of the motion, 
the rate of the motions, the accelerations of the motions, how much you want to weigh those influences, and how fast you want to move these surfaces, it should really depend on your environmental conditions, which means that wave heights, wave periods, and wave direction in respect to the vessels. So we really, this is, to figure out this right coefficient, it's really difficult task for even very experienced crew to actually do it. This made us think that this is actually a very interesting problem for machine learning, because we said that, okay, this is a really complex environment that is very difficult for human brain to actually understand all this relationship between the environments, the forces that are acting, and the consequence of that forces and the environmental forces on the vessel. And, and therefore, we said that, okay, we can actually do utilize machine learning here to actually optimize this controller. When we thought about it, we actually said that we can actually do it in not only in one way, but at least in three different ways. And the first approach, which we now is, uh, deployed to a number of vessels, is basically we do a system identification of the response of the vessel based on the data in a sort of time averaged behavior. I will go deeper to that later. Uh, and then we use that plus optimizations on board of the vessel to do the optimizations of these coefficients in real time. The second approach is called predictive, model predictive control, or MPC, which is a, a really interesting subject in a control theory. I'm not going to go deep into it tonight uh, because it has a very, it is much deeper discussion. And we also thought about using reinforcement learning. So basically the difference between these three approaches is that the first approach try to adjust this coefficient, so you give it a controller, and it try to adjust that coefficient of the controller to minimize the motion. Uh, and subjected to understanding from the data what is the relationship between the input and essentially the output, the controller settings. Whereas the other two approaches, it's they, they are not making any assumptions on the form of the control, uh, controller, but they directly learn that if the vessel is basically in a particular state, what should be the command that uh, would actually result in the best motion of it? So the first approach, this is, uh, we deployed this on a ship. And so the way that we call this advisory system, and the, uh, we call it an advisory system essentially because it provides advice to the crew. And uh, the way that it works, if you look at the pipeline here, so we, we have the ship, we gathered a lot of data from different range of different sensors on the ship. So then we have two passes, so essentially I'll go through the shore first. So basically that pass auto goes through uh, NIFI, which is, sits on the, uh, on the ship, then goes on the NIFI, which is actually on the shore. Then we have two passes, we basically send it to an influx uh, time series and then Grafana to show the results into engineers. But the main thing is that we actually store those out on S3. Then here we have our machine learning models, which basically use this data that has been uh, measured on the vessel, plus making an API call to external source to get the Metocean information that was at the point of time in, in the vessel, build the machine learning models. The machine learning models will be deployed uh, to, uh, to S3, then will be deployed automatically to the ship through a Docker container. The Docker container then utilizes the data from uh, that measured all the sensors measured on the ship, to adjust the uh, settings of the controller in real time and, and also make, an, uh, again, external sources to, uh, to understand what is the statistical representations of the seal state, and then provide that information and update the settings of the controller and set back into the, uh, to, to the crew. So this part on the left is essentially a blow up of this, uh, this Docker container or in, in, in a more controlled way. So again, you, you remember this, this part is exactly the whole control. So you have the ship, you have the wave force acting on it, and then here is where our controller is sitting. So one of the measurements, we're making the measurements of the motion. The motion will actually go to the controller, but the controller also relies on these coefficients that basically are here. Then we also make the measurements that we're actually making on board. We make an, on board of the vessel, we make an API call to understand the uh, excitation, uh, to understand the statistical uh, wave con conditions. Then we run it to the predictor, which we result, uh, show the results of it. The predictor predicts what is going to be the motion of RMS and the MSI for these particular conditions and this particular, uh, basically, vessel, giving different settings. Then we have an optimizer that on board of the vessel, which essentially runs on, uh, online uh, with, with connection with the predictor. The predictor works as a fitness function for the optimizer. 
for optimize the settings, the settings will go to the controller, and then the controller will actually set the uh, uh, control commands that go to the actuator and move the surfaces. So to do that, we basically, as an example that I want to show here, one of these chips that we gather data for about seven months, and this data we basically we had about uh, we looked at each of these data points is essentially a ten minutes uh, representations of the conditions, and a lot. Basically, from those data, we build our predictor models. We basically predict different uh, motion RMS, and we, we basically see that, okay, we can do a very good job on predicting versus the uh, uh, real measurements. And we also do the same thing for uh, motion sickness, uh, which is, again, motion sickness actually derived by the heave accelerations of the vessel, or vertical acceleration of the vessel. And then, again, we also see that, okay, generally, we have a very good accuracy at uh, our error is less than 0.1 of a, uh, 0.2 of a degree, essentially. So to give you how well this actually system works, so this is, this is a comparison that once this system actually uh, deployed, when the system is deployed, the optimum settings across two different wave periods and wave headings with respect to the vessel, between what the crew generally run the vessel with and what the system, the predictor system and the optimizations running on top of the vessel can actually reduce the amount of the motion of the vessel. And we show that this system can reduce the roll motion of the vessel by 20 to 25% and the MSI by around 15%. MSI is much more difficult because we are not directly controlling it. And I will talk about it a little bit more. Uh, actually, let me explain what MSI works. Okay, MSI is a motion sickness in incident, which essentially means that the people are going to throw up. <laughs> the percentage of the people that are going to throw up. And it's essentially governed by the vertical accelerations of the uh, the uh, the, the ship, and it's a function of the different frequencies and how that vertical acceleration is actually distributed across different frequencies. And basic, then, then we said that, okay, so we, we saw that, that, that how that system worked, and then we said that, okay, can we go a bit more real time now? Can we go and respond more reactively and respond more uh, to each of these single waves that are going to actually hit the vessel? So as I said, that we, we, the main thing that we actually developed was an MPC controller, model predictive controller. I will show the results of it and compare it against the reinforcement learning. So for reinforcement learning, what we did, we built a, essentially a soft actor critic agent, which uh, our deep learning agent essentially has to interact with the environment, which is the vessel moving in waves, make an action, which is adjusting the control, uh, uh, sorry. Oh, the, um, the no, soft, uh, soft actor critic. Uh, uh, yeah. it, uh, I, I was just wondering if it's the the slow engineering model environment or your or your proxy. No, this is this is essentially the environment which you model it through the Merkel simulations. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And and then essentially making making this uh, adjusting the control angles, uh, so the angle of the foils. To therefore, then we measure the reward by how much this vessel is actually moving. And, and then understand that what is the consequence of this uh, basically adjusting and, le and learning how to adjust this uh, uh, basically for each wave. So we have our state is defined based on the displacement of the vessel, the uh, velocity of the vessel, the commands and the command rate basically at different step, and also waves and the wave velocity at different points around the vessel. The action is essentially the angle, the control angle of the foil. The reward is basically uh, penalizing because we want to actually reward it if our motion at different modes, particularly roll and pitch, and their acceleration, and also penalizing with how fast it can actually see, uh, move these uh, foil surfaces. So essentially, what happens is that it interacts with the simulations, and then it basically ran and uh, uh, basically maximizes this reward. And the beauty of it, this is that the SAC is actually also try to uh, not only maximize the reward, but also maximizing the, the, how it, uh, the uh, exploration through the entropy coefficient. So comparing at the results, so I start first with uh, basically if it's a passive control. The passive control means the surface is there, we're not controlling it. And we're looking at one particular uh, essentially C state uh, in the HS and TP, but across different wave heading, wave heading coming from different angles to the waves, to the vessel. So we're looking at the roll motion. And the roll motion is the motion side to side motion, the rotations of the vessel. And uh, of course, when you're BMC, it means that your waves coming from the side, you get the maximum roll motion. 
uh, and you are in head C, you should not get much of a roll motion. Uh, so the passive controller, then we basically show that if we have an optimized setting, so basically the controller with the fully optimized setting on board of the vessel, then we looked at the, our reinforcement learning and we saw that, well, it does a good job with respect to the passive, but still it cannot, uh, it's, it's generally much closer to uh, basically what the optimum setting is actually doing. And then we looked at MPC and we see that the MPC, of course, it outperforms it significantly. That's what you expect from an MPC behavior. We looked at pitch motion. Pitch motion is more interesting because essentially your maximum pitch motion happens at the head C or back quartering C. We looked at it and said that, okay, the, 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 the fact is that you have more control, essentially hydrodynamically, roll is more controllable than pitch. Uh, for this evaluation, when you ran it, did you run it on the t recorded test set or did you run it on the simulation on new data? No, completely different test sets. So what happened here is that, that's a, that's a good point. So what happened here is that we trained, we trained the model on a completely, because each, each, of, each of the episodes that we're training, it's a random realization of, a different, of, of that CSA, okay? Then what happened here, when we're testing it here, essentially this, this column is that this is the RMS of emotion. But for each of these CS state, again, we ran again so many different realization of that one. And from that, each of those realizations, we calculated the RMS of the motion. And then we took the mean of that RMS of the motion, which is the column, and the standard deviation of that RMS of the motion. So it shows that the variability of the system with one C state because your, your weights are so random. And then we're looking at uh, basically pitch motion. It's interesting because in pitch, we see that soft actor critic essentially, or the reinforcement learning, is doing a much better job compared to the optimized settings, but still it cannot actually keep up with what MPC does. Then I was interested to see if I take this part and look at it and see how, what is the policy that this uh, soft actor critic is actually learning and how is actually compared to MPC. I took, I took a, a, a basically, so this is, this is the simulated environment that we basically the simulated uh, conditions that we run it. So what you see here is basically the pitch motion. So uh, this essentially representations of this RMS value that we show here. So this is the, the time series of the pitch. The blue one is when it's controlled by MPC, and the red one is when actually controlled by the reinforcement learning. It was really interesting to me because if you look at it, these lines here represent the, uh, the RMS of that uh, thing. So the, the SAC, it has a higher RMS, but interestingly, it actually has a lower maximum motion. So in terms of controlling the maximum motion, at least in this condition, it could actually improve, it could basically outperform the MPC to reduce that maximum motion. But in general, if, when we look at the RMS of the motion, it could not actually uh, uh, reduce the RMS. And to me, that might be an artifact of the reward function or how we actually reward, rewarding this agent. Uh, but then when I looked at the, this, uh, this is the command. So basically, this is what the, the reinforcement learning actually sends or the MPC sends to the surface. This is, to me, was really interesting when I look at this. Because if I look at it, the blue one is the MPC, uh, uh, the MPC uh, command for one of the surfaces, and the red one is, again, the soft actor critic command. You see that there are a lot of similarities between what the soft actor critic is actually doing with the surfaces and what the MPC, which is our totally best controller, does with it, it suggests that the SAC is trying to converge and learn this kind of, uh, this type of uh, basically policy that represents that coming from the MPC. The black lines essentially are the maximum, the bandwidth, the, the, the constraints that the system has to actually travel between it. Now, this, these uh, limits are hard constraints that is basically for both MPC and SAC because that's when the action space is actually sampled from. But if you look at the how fast they actually move the surfaces is again interesting because this is for reinforcement learning, it only came from this penalty term uh, inside the reward function and not directly uh, inside the constraint of it. So it's a sort of a soft uh, uh, constraint in reinforcement learning, whereas MPC, you can actually have a hard uh, basically constraint on the uh, rate of the uh, motions of these foils. 
And again, you see a lot of similarities between uh, the pattern that basically these, uh, these two are actually doing. But we see that again, from time to time, this uh, reinforcement is actually overshooting the, uh, these things, means that it actually requires much faster responses. This is, again, a short come from, me, from this uh, basically a, a sort of reinforcement learning. And it might be basically if you go back to the reward function and then increase the penalty coefficients of that penalty function, it might actually improve it. Looking at MSI is interesting to me because we see that MSI, although we are not directly controlling the MSI, but we see that, again, SAC is, is, is doing an okay job in reducing uh, compared to the optimized setting, but it still is not, it cannot keep up with something like MPC. And uh, so, again, just the conclusion is that we see that the uh, MPC of it seems to outperform even the reinforcement learning still cannot cope with it. But uh, one thing that was really important for me was, and I realized through this experiment, is that the behavior of the reinforcement learning is extremely depending on how we actually do the, uh, the reward function. Play a little bit with the reward function and it basically completely have a different behavior. And this is, for me as an engineer, a sort of concern for this type of, if you, you want to rely on that as a controller, because if your controller is so sensitive to those parameters in real life, that might be a bit of a challenge for these complex problems. And the other, the other downside of the uh, reinforcement learning is that it has to interact with the environment. It has to interact with the environment to learn, although SAG is actually off policy, but still you have to actually interact with the environment to actually learn it. And in, in real conditions, you don't want to shake the vessel and say that, okay, passengers, please uh, put your seatbelt on. We are going to actually train our reinforcement learning <laughs> and, uh, and then sh shake them around. Uh, we basically, so you want to have a more reliable control system actually acting there. And this made us thinking that maybe the next step for us was looking into it, actually looking into offline reinforcement learning and try to actually see if we can actually do better with that. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone have any question, I can pass the mic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so in the first few slides, you had the kind of proxy environment, right? Yep. And so you made that, but you haven't used it yet? Or? No. So basically, if, if you're referring to here, let me go back. So if you're referring to this behavior. Oh, uh, uh, well, so in the, f in the f like in the introduction, uh, so quite a few back, uh, a few more, that one. This one? Yeah, so No, we are not using this still for oh, the motion. Right. So this is because this is, uh, okay. So predicting the result of the uh, engineering simulation is there, it's, it's a really difficult task to do. So what we're actually doing is we first learning that we make sure that we can actually result in a steady behavior, in a, in a static behavior first. And this is the pressure when the wind is actually over, coming over the vessel. So that pressure is basically it's a, it's a steady snapshot. But then you look going to the motion is a lot more challenges because even the simulations that we actually, if we want to learn from the simulations, we require a lot of simulation, a lot of, uh, which takes a lot of time to actually perform those things. So our hope is definitely that's a really interesting point. Our hope is really we want to actually take this to that stage that we would be able to actually use this, what we call it emulator in real life, that basically the emulator will base, predict exactly what's going to be the motion, but we are still not at that stage. Okay, okay. Um. The, uh, wind, uh, the effect of wind direction. Ring, ring, ring. I don't know whether it's working, is it? Hello. <laughs> Anyway, uh, the effect of wind direction and also harmonics, is, are, is it data you've never really looked at or? That's, that's, okay, let's go here. So if you look at what we're actually doing here, which is the environment. So the environment that we modeled in this case is basically is the full hydrodynamic model. That full hydrodynamic model takes to account all the effects that you're basically referring to. If you're talking about using those in the predictions in this stage, that essentially doesn't matter because at that stage, we're only looking at something which is 
over a period of time. So that those behaviors will return, will basically become meaningful in terms of some statistical representations of those behaviors, which we said that, for example, the RMS of the motion, and then we try to learn the relationship between that uh, statistical representations with the statistical representations of the C state, because all of those behaviors of the C state can be translated into statistical terms, which is basically some significant wave height and some wave periods and directions of it. Hi, that's that's really interesting. The um, the I'm, I'm interested in the MPC approach as well, and how you would improve that, and what that model is in the in the MPC controller. Is it a, a simple linear, linear model of of the response to the waves, or can you do something with nonlinear MPC? That's a, that's a really good question. And essentially, MPC you have by default what happens here is that you have a state space representations of your system dynamics and that state space representations of your system dynamics you also require an estimations of your uh, basically uh, disturbances that we're going to actually run it so in the simulations that we provided here because they're all running in a simulated environment so the mpc is really perfect because the simulated environment itself is linear but the mpc there is a nonlinear mpc and essentially if you, if you think about mpc that Things that MPC requires, the things that the elements of the MPC is that you have a mathematical model of your system, you have a cost function, and you have a mathematical function that you're actually trying to, uh, mathematical optimizations that you're running over your cost function, and plus some constant. So if you have all of these elements, you can have an MPC. So if you can have a, in an MPC that we are basically running here is a linear state, state, uh, state space representations of the uh, system dynamic, but you can replace that with a nonlinear model. It can be even a neural network model that basically resolve, uh, uh, understand based on the disturbances that actually getting, what is the response of the vessel. Uh, my personal view is that you really don't need to go there because, first of all, there are two things here. One is that if you go for a nonlinear MPC, your optimization times can become really uh, constant because your optimization time can be time consuming. Mm -hmm. And mean, meaning that if you have a sampling time of your controller, which is very short, you may not be able to actually do online optimizations between that sampling period of time that your controller has. Yeah. So you're better off not going toward that direction. But the beauty of the MPC is that essentially what it does, you have a control horizon. It looks at that control horizon and it optimizes for the control horizon. But it only takes the first element of it, the first controller parameters, implement it and then do it again. So essentially, even if you have a nonlinear system, you can assume your nonlinear system is a piecewise linear system. So within that control horizon, it can actually have a, a, a right behavior. In addition to that, what we're actually looking into is we're combining MPC with the Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter allows us to actually do a sort of estimations on the, on the state of the vessel and also estimations of the, uh, of the disturbances of that, uh, that uh, environment. Yeah. So combining this together, we can actually correct for how much, how much we rely on the estimation that's coming from the, uh, the MPC model plus the measurement that we're basically getting, how much we rely, test, uh, uh, we rely on this measurement, how much we rely on the measurement that we're getting on the vessel. So combining these things to me, I personally believe that a linear MPC with a Kalman filter, it can actually do us the job on, on board of the vessel. Cool. Is there a system to prevent them from running into each other? Running what to do what? Running, you mean ships to each other? Crashing into each other. I mean, Japan the ships here you're talking about. Uh, the ship. Okay, first of all, we are not controlling the 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 course of a vessel here. We're no. talking about controlling the motion of the vessel, the motion that the vessel responds to the waves. There are two different but things. Absolutely, that uh, the course keeping itself is a different matter, different subject that you can actually uh, have on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely different matter. We, because we are not looking on that, we trust that the captain is really good in seeing where it's going for the time being. Like BHP can't keep a train on the railway tracks. and they, I think the no train people. on the railway track is much easier than ships <laughs> in the waves. Awesome talk, Ashkin. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, are you doing much now on look ahead from the ship to observe the sea state? What, what sort of work are you doing in that space? Yeah, so basically we did, uh, we did several work on that one. First of all, we, on, a, on a separate topic, we, we looked into essentially predicting the waves. If you, are, if you have some upstream measurements, predict the waves. That's really straightforward. 
But also one of the things that we discuss is that an input that can be up to any of these models, if you have an expand radar on your vessel and then basically scan the environment and then utilizing that scan environment in terms of the waves and feed back into either of these controllers to, to improve their behavior. Now, that is a really interesting topic. We're really keen on it. But the problem with that is two, two, two types of problem. One is that the moment you go, those systems are costly, really costly in terms of doing that. There's a time associated to basically to be able to utilize those uh, information into the, uh, to the controller. And bringing this together in terms of the controller, it might actually affect the response time of the controller. So my personal view is that if I can get away with a controller that can actually do a good job without requiring of the input of the waves exactly into the controller, that would be a much, much, much better controller. And that's why I personally, again, believe that if you have an observer for your controller, which essentially the job of is to observe the disturbances, because even if you have the perfect knowledge of the waves, what drives your uh, uh, controller is not the waves, it's the wave excitation force that actually drives your uh, uh, controller. So you somehow have to bring that information back into that wave excitation for to pass it to your controller. So if, if you design an observer for the controller, that the job of the observer is to actually predict and estimate that uh, basically uh, the, the, the disturbances, which is the wave excitation for, that is a much more reliable controller than relying on scanning the waves. But that is a definitely very, very interesting. And I don't know whether my view on that will change as we move forward and try to deploy this into a real condition. Uh, for I think it was the uh, model predictive controller, and you showed it in a Docker container in the cloud. No. Oh, was I wrong about that? Okay. I think we have so many different controllers. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, here this Docker container is is again I want to go back. It's based on a time average representations of the dynamic of a system. So instead of saying that the model predictive controller is actually doing it step by step for each single point in time. But this control that we're actually putting in it is that it's understand that if you are in a, in a sea state or in an environmental condition that represented statistically with this condition, what would be your statistical uh, important uh, parameters of your motion? For example, RMS of your motion. So that's, with, that's the model. Right. Uh, my question was more about deployment. So like, is there going to be, like, if you're thinking about eventual deployment, are you going to have a server on the boat? No. So basically what happens, this is, this is already deployed on the vessel, okay? This, this, this is already on the vessel, okay? So what happens here is that we have a small laptop on the vessel, which basically, that does the job perfectly well. So it's basically, that laptop, it has uh, basically the, the, the database associated to it, and then it actually reads a database, and that uh, uh, for, uh, run the optimizations and the prediction at the same time, and basically optimize the settings. And in real time, it provides back uh, to the crew on a tablet, which is in front of the crew. So it ends up being quite a small model, right? So it's just kind Absolutely. of outputting the because PID calibration yep. each time. And, and so it's just CPU laptop? Absolutely, yeah, it's a CPU right. laptop. Right. Yeah. It's a very simple, very, because again, you're only worrying about optimizing this coefficient. You think that I know the control law, I only want to optimize its coefficient. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what, what is the pilot thing? Because whenever you put these out, the pilots always have like strong opinions, you know? Like, it's usually send that message, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the only thing I kind of a little bit hazy on is the the bounds that you showed with the uh, soft actor criti critic model. I'm not sure this thing is on, by the way. This one? Yeah. So the the black line, I, yep. I couldn't. I blanked out a little bit there. What precisely? How did you manage to calculate that? What is the okay. significance? Okay. Okay. Let's let's look at it this way. First, I go here. Here. Look at here. So you want to you want to maximize this lift force, let's say. So this lift force has a sort of nonlinear behavior, meaning that at some angle, what happens here is that if you move your surfaces beyond some angle, you start cavitating. Cavitating means that it actually reduces the forces. So we really want to be within these bandwidths between these two 
where the, the lift force behavior is sort of linear. So this gives us the limit on the how, fa how, how, how far the surfaces has to move. I see, because I see. Okay, so that's kind of like the bounds on that linear area. Absolutely. Okay. And then there's a hydraulic system here, which has to follow on this. So that hydraulic system does not allow the very fast changes. So that is basically, That is this one. Yep. So the first one is the action space that the, the soft actor critic to learn to sample from it. And that is uh, really a constraint. But the second one is actually a constant that sets through the reward function of the soft actor critic. OK, OK. Yeah, just, that makes sense. Yep. Is this a real mic? Is, yeah. it, is, um, is the. Do you also need to think about development of the simulation package, the hydrodynamic model? Absolutely, absolutely, model you mentioned? definitely. So basically, uh, this is a, this is a. I think this is a different big question that comes to the hydrodynamic modeling of the system. And and essentially, we really want to be able to. to we have to verify that our hydrodynamic model is really accurate. Essentially, in my view, none of these mathematical models are accurate. Because there are a lot of nonlinearities, a lot of conditions that are happening in the in, in the real environment that it's really hard for these uh, uh, simulations to be able to capture it. But what once we are actually what we are doing at this stage, we are evaluating all of these controllers within one uh, 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 hydrodynamic model. So to us, as long as that accuracy is good enough in terms of capturing the maximum roll motions or the maximum heave motion, heave is generally accurate, really accurately uh, represented. That's fine. But then we actually want to really go to the next step. We want to actually replace that hydrodynamic model mm -hmm. with the system identification model that comes from the vessel, that basically running the vessel, and yeah. use that as an environment, essentially, to test it. Any more questions? Okay, well, if there's no more questions, then folks, if you give a big hand for Ashkan. Thank you very much.